Coming up, I'm your host, Fred Minnick, Editor-in-Chief of Bourbon Plus Magazine. Dave Pickrell was a legend. When he passed away in November, we lost our Iron Man. Somebody who consulted on more than 100 distilleries from Ecuador to New York and served as master distiller for Hill Rock, Whistlepig, and most notably, Maker's Mark. In this interview, I asked Dave some hard questions. And he talked about what it's like to take on controversy and to make whiskey in today's world. It was one of his last interviews in life. And I'm going to miss him. So I grabbed a bottle of his, one of his last Whistle Pig products. And I want to toast to him. You can find this bottle here at the Bardstown Bourbon Company. I encourage you to toast him as well. So please, as you do so, drink responsibly and remember Dave Pickerel. Cheers. You dirty dog. You brought me a little boss hog. I, I did. Not only a boss hog, I brought you the new boss hog. I'll be damned. This one isn't even on the shelf yet. Well, I mean, thank you. Thank My you pleasure. for doing that, man. And um, So first of all, what is up with this cork? It seems like 15 pounds. Yeah, about, yeah. What, what, um, the, what the hell? I mean, seriously, I mean, are you trying to, like, kill people with it, like, when you're done with the well, bottle? Well, you know, it, it's a special whiskey, and we, need, we thought it needed a special topper. And uh, um, and there's a little bit of history behind every one of our Boss Hog rounds. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and part of this is is also helping a small business. So there was this little pewter shop that was um, family run. It's been in existence for g decades or generations, and they they were struggling a little bit. Yeah. And, and we thought, you know, this would be a good way to keep a family business in the family. And. Uh, and do something fun for us. And so we started doing these pewter tops on the Boss Hog bottles. Um, this D one Dan is Forth Pewter. Dan Forth Pewter. It's right down the road from us. Yeah. And uh, this particular one is that the the whiskey is called the Spirit of Mauve. Our, sadly, our pet pig Mauve passed away on Valentine's Day this year. Did you eat her? Um, no. We include. We we Hold on now. I know you. We I know you. You didn't eat your. You didn't eat the hog. We interned her in a mausoleum. What? Yes, we've got we've got her her ashes and Mortimer's ashes are in a shrine at the distillery. Okay. Um, I mean, people That's, can come right. pay homage. They, we've got a, a bowl with some white whiskey that you can pour out and light so that you can have a flame to pay honor to Let, them. Let's be honest; those ribs would have been really nice. Well, with some smoke. we got a rule though. We got two different kinds of pigs. We got yeah. Cooney Coonies and we got Mangalises. Okay. The Cooney Coonies are pets. All right. The Mangalises are breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> We Is that had bacon. We had one whose name was Bacon. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and he lived up to his name. He he was a seven hundred pound pig when we slaughtered him. Holy Jesus! He, he tried to eat you when you'd feed him. He was that big. And uh, and uh, when we when we slaughtered him, he made some of the best bacon you ever had. I mean, Megalistas are kind of like the Kobe oh. of pork. Oh my God! And oh, so good. Yeah. We ate we ate we ate high on the hog for a long time. Literally. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. My God, you've been you've been in the business for a long time, and I gotta say that you have touched more distilleries than what I believe any other person in American history. I, I can't prove that yet uh, because I have not been able to track a lot of other distillers from the 1800s. Mm -hmm. But I know from uh, from a contemporary standpoint, you have been more impactful and influential than any other distiller in the country. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, one of the things that's not well known is in, in three generations ago, the impactful guy was Colonel E.H. Taylor. Yeah. And Colonel Taylor, you know, built Old Crow, Old Taylor, yeah. you know, the, the, the Old Fire Copper, which is now Buffalo Trace. He yep. built the LeBron Graham, which is now what He got Preserve. sued by a few people, too, in, yeah, in that process. But, uh, kind of like you. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> Colonel E.H. Taylor is my great granddaughter. I know. And uh, and I have, um, I have one desire of, of, of a legacy. You know, everybody 
you know, wants a legacy of some kind. And, and I would love that after I've shuffled off this mortal coil, that somebody in true honesty says that the footprint I left on this industry was as big as the one that Colonel Taylor left. That's interesting. And that's, that's why I work the way that I do is because I, I've got big footprint to fill. And, uh, um, and I want to, I want to do honor to him. Do you follow social media at all? I do. Do you track the, when the marketing kind of turmoil that comes out every time we have a new whistle pig release? Do you see that stuff? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, um, you got to take the good and the bad with a grain of salt, you know, yeah. both ends, you know, you know, people say, don't read your own press. Um, you know, because either you're going to get a big head or you're going to be, or you're going to be depressed. Um, at the end of the day, I just want to make good whiskey. And that's what I'm all about is, is, is making stuff that people can enjoy and that can, that they can fulfill their life with. And, and, you know, this isn't where, this isn't rocket science. This isn't brain surgery. You know, this is about making people's life better. And, and if I can do that, I'm good. And, you know, and if people want to trash me for using third-party whiskey, okay, go for it. Um, that makes you feel better. But um, at the end of the day, I always said, you know, it doesn't matter where I get it from. If you like the way it tastes and you're okay with the price, a little thank you would be nice. So you think people should just judge whiskey by the taste versus the production aspects? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean... You know, there's, you know, people get trashed all the time for MGPI juice. You know, oh, it's just MGPI. Oh, it's, you know, I, I guarantee if you took my whistle pig 12-year-old and compared it to bullet rye, nobody in their right mind is going to say those are the same two products mm -hmm. because it's what we did after we got it. You know, we took that, we finished it in uh, in. Uh, Sauterne, we finished it in Madeira, we finished in Port, we married it together. The con concept, from concept to bottle on that was four and a half years. That was longer than most people wait to bring a bourbon out on the market. Yeah. And uh, so for people to criticize me and say that somehow that I didn't apply craft because I started with MGPI juice, they're just, they, they're just not my kind of people. Now, one of your partners, Raj, got himself in some trouble here and there and is brought uh, a lot of attention to whistle pig you know in the from in the courts and so forth um what's that been like for you because it's never been you getting dragged through the mud in that perspective it's often been raj being getting getting sued by partners and so forth and you have to come th through and defend him what has that been like for you well you know um at the end of the day whistle pig couldn't have started without raj because, you know, I didn't have the money. And, R and Raj had the, the money and the guts to, to put behind my foresight. Um, and so, you know, I could never trash Raj. Um, did he make some missteps? Yeah, probably. Um, um, were the shareholders always happy with him? Eh, probably not. Um, at the end of the day, um, the brand couldn't be where it is without him. Um, and the fact is that, uh, that he's decided to go on to other things now. And... Uh, um, you know, he's, uh, he still has, is a silent partner. He still has some shares, but he's completely given up all um, 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 authority and rights and, and doesn't have anything to do with Whistle Pig anymore because um, um, he, he knew it was time for him to move on to other things. Is that hard for you? Because I know you actually formed a friendship with the guy. Um, Any time a person, you know, struggles in life, a friend of mine struggles in life. It bothers me. It's it, it and it hurts. And you know, I'd like I'd like to see things do well. And uh, and you know, and I and I'm and you know, it, from all accounts, it appears that he's doing well. And his you know what whatever he's heading on next, I, he hadn't given me a peek at what he's doing yet. Let's hope he's not riding elephants across the border <laughs> again. Let's you know, I got to tell you though, that was brilliant. That we, um, you know, that's one of the things that attracted me to him, is that uh, he's a keen marketing guy. You know, like. He, he understood some. He was running for a political office um, in, a, in a district where it, where it was decidedly in the favor of the other candidate. And, uh, and so much so he couldn't even get local press. And, and he goes, how in the world am I going to get the force the press to cover me? And, and his conclusion was, I need to pick a national issue 
and do something outlandish enough that the national media cover it, and that'll force the local people to cover it. And, and so he adopted border security. He goes down the border, actually videoed a guy running across the river, and nobody from the, from the Immigration and Nationalization Service did anything about it until he shamed him into it. And during the process of that, he said, I believe I could march across this river with a mariachi band and a herd of elephants. And then that immediately led to him actually taking a herd of elephants and a mariachi band and tromping around out in the river. And it forced, it forced the national coverage, which forced the local coverage, and it made the race a heck of a lot closer than it would have otherwise been. And so even though that was really you know, outlandish and goofy, it served a brilliant purpose. And, you know, and, you know heck, we used, to do, we used to do wacky stuff like that at Maker's Mark. You know, and, uh, um, and so, you know, it's, it's hard for me to fault that kind of logic because, because sometimes, sometimes you got to do stuff to get people to pay attention. What was your first drink? My very first drink was a Smirnoff vodka. Oh, come on, Dave. I was 12 years old. I oh, was, for God's sake. That's I was young. stealing dad's stuff. You know, it was whatever he had. I mean, it was a choice between that and Canadian mist. And, uh, and, and I was a... <laughs> you chose vodka over Canadian I mist. I chose vodka over that, Canadian that's mist. That's saying something I was right 12 there. years old. And, yeah. and I mixed it. And the, the thing was, I mixed it with the orange drink in the fridge, and it was okay. And uh, <laughs> but that was the first thing I had. Sorry. Would you, would you recommend 12 year Year olds no. drinking. I wouldn't recommend. I wouldn't recommend twelve year olds drink any spirit. I mean, you know, I was a recalcitrant kid, and uh, but I will say, I raised my kids a little different. Um, Smart ones. Um, I knew that. First of all, I've got so much spirits and wine at the house. There's no way that I could dictate no, and so I said, "Look, kids, there's plenty of stuff here." I'm going to tell you, don't sneak. Yeah. If you want something, let me proctor it. If you want to try some wine, let's taste some good wine. Let's don't, let's don't have any green springs like I used to have when I'd go bribe the drunk to get something from the, from the liquor store. Um, sorry. I, <laughs> but, what was your first car? Uh, my first car was a 69 Mustang with a 351 Windsor engine in it. Damn. And I built the rebuilt the thing completely. I paid six hundred bucks for it, and rebuilt every last piece in it. That's when you could get down in the engine and disassemble it. And I rebuilt every piece in that car. Well, Dave, I have always enjoyed my time with you. Of course, a couple weeks ago, we were hanging out with Metallica backstage. You've been with Metallica a lot lately, but that was an experience for me. Oh my God. It is so fun. Yeah. Um, you know, they, uh, um, it was like a commissioning. You know, they, it wasn't like they just said, we're going to hire you, go. It was, like, it was like they came to me and said, look, we, we're looking for new and interesting ways to connect with our fan base. And we think whiskey is a new and interesting way to connect. And we think you're the guy to do it. So make us proud. And that was, that was about the only guidance I got. So yeah. I've seen some I've seen some commentary of, of of people who learned about the whiskey from the Metallica side, mm-hmm. and they're like comparing them to Kiss, calling them sellouts and everything. I didn't personally get that feel when I was around them. No, I, yeah, I don't either. I, not at all. To me, they're a really genuine group. I mean. You know, I've always had rule, there's rules about how, how I decide who I'm going to work with because I can't work with everybody. And it's just three things. The first rule is no jerks. If I can't be friends with you, we can't do business together. And the second rule is you got to have a good business plan. And the third rule is you got to be a learner. And if we got those three things, we're good. And, uh, and Metallica fills that bill completely. I mean, you know, first time I met Robert Trujillo, he, I, I felt like, you know, he was honest to goodness sad that I had to leave. Um, you know, when I met Lars, it was just funny. He just walks up to me and sticks his hand out and goes, hi, I'm the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was laughing so hard. I wanted to say, hi, I'm the distiller. But I, I was laughing so hard I couldn't say it. Um, 
you know, James is uh, is sober, and uh, he and I were chatting in uh, in uh, um, at one of the one of the little settings up there in Madison, and uh, we were having some good conversation. And finally, he looks over at me. He goes, "Do you like cigars?" I said, "Oh, I love cigars," and he was almost screamed. And he goes, "I finally found a vice that I can share with Dave Pickerel." <laughs> And I mean, that's the kind of guys they are. They're genuine and sincere, and and uh, and they want to do things the right way. And, and you know, and, and when I put the whiskey together, I said, "Look, I appreciate the commissioning process and your trust and confidence in me, but I expect you to to to, uh, to assemble a murder board. And when I think I got it right, I want you to convene the murder board, and we're going to compare it against good whiskeys." Yeah, and I picked, and I won't tell you which ones because it's not my intent to trash products or anything. But we picked the best local American whiskey that I could come up with. I picked the best national American whiskey that I could come up with. I picked the best American whiskey that I've been involved in. And I said, and I said, we're going to taste against those because because I only want to go against the best. And if you don't, and 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 after you've compared these, y'all got to honestly tell me where it rates. And if it's not good enough. I got to go back and do some more work. And we had, we had some discussion, and uh, there were there was a, there were a couple of guys. There was one very very wealthy man who's who's been in the news recently, who was, had really had some pointed things to say, and some and some big critiques, but at the end of the day, every single one of them took a pass on it and said this is this is this is this is the answer. This is the good stuff. Huh? And uh, um, and that's when I knew that I, I was ready to roll with it. Well, Dave, it's always a pleasure to spend time with you. I love you mo- first and foremost because we're both veterans, and that's a bond that you cannot take away, and we both volunteered. So yep. cheers to that and to cheers. our brothers and sisters who serve and to whiskey. And to whiskey. And you got to tell me how you like this guy. Well, it's not Black Prince. Not supposed to be. Yeah, it's not Black Prince. This is the idea is Black Prince was big and bold. This is more elegant. I'll get back builds. to you on this one. I All got. Right. I, I don't know if I like it right off the bat. You All know right. me. I don't. I don't. I know. You know I'm genuine. I tell you yep. the truth. But uh, I'm uh, just tasting it right off the bat. And maybe it's because I love so many of your other releases. But this one is like falling really flat for me on the finish. Well, let it keep going, because uh, I won't give up on it. I know, because my <laughs> my personal belief is that this is this is the best boss hog I've ever. Released. Oh, Black Prince was so good. I, I know you really really love Black Prince, oh, but here's so good. Here's the difference. This one, the way this develops is so cool for me, because because it hits the palate, and and all of the rice spice caramel and, and vanilla stuff just spreads out over the front half of the tongue, the front two thirds actually. I will say this. I will say this. I taste three times. For my professional tastings, I taste three times because I never want to be influenced by weather or my my mood or atmosphere or anything like that. It's pretty. It, the atmosphere is Atmosphere's a little doggy right now. Today, yeah. That could be throwing me off. Maybe. So I'll, I'll, I'll but, taste it again. But then after after it kind of covers the whole tongue, then you get this right cross that comes up the inside of your lips, and it's all the it's all the calvados, and the calvados comes up over the top, and then. It kind of crushes down, and for me, the memory that it evokes is the memory of my grandma's apple pie sitting on. Oh, for on God's a, sake! Now that's going to be implanted in my head. Good, because yeah. that's what you need to think about. Is I, and I imagine that apple pie just sitting there on the and it's on the window ledge, and it's got it's it's that kind that's got the crisscross dough on yeah. the top and a little bit of the apples, and uh, and that's what this is like to me. It's just like. By the time it's done, and you get that 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 last piece, and the apple crashes down on top of the the the, the spices, it's like drinking grandma's apple pie to me. And it, maybe that it's just that that for me it evokes such a strong memory of grandma's apple Nose pie. Nose is incredible. The taste. I'll give a little more shot. Right. But here, I right know now. you love great big bold taste, and this is not bold. This is elegant. Is that the number on me? Yeah. I'm, I'm big and bold. Yep. This is definitely the number on you. I never know what people think of me, like from my from my palate perspective. Oh, I can tell you right off the bat. Yeah. You like stuff that just grabs you by the shoulders and slaps your mama. 
That is true. <laughs> you really did.